What's up, Ross? <laughs> Long time no see, buddy. How was that trip? Oh, man, it was eye-opening. I appreciate you hooking me up with Mike's steak. Got to meet Mason, and awesome. I see, man, I see why the lead is such a big issue. I know. I'm so glad you were able to make that trip. I have one more person I want you to meet, Kelly Sorensen, our executive director, and he's right inside. Kelly, you in Great. there? Oh, there he is. Hey, hey how's hey, it going? Kelly? Hey, Ross. Ross Thomas, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice Heard to lots meet of you. great things. Likewise. All right, well, beautiful day in Big Sur. Welcome to our Discovery Center. Thanks. Thanks. Come inside. Love to. Let's go check it out. So, Kelly, I've now seen firsthand how lead toxicity is the number one threat for condors. But I'm curious about wildfires. I wonder if you can take us back to the 2008 Basin Fire and tell me the story of Phoenix. So I was actually up there at the Condor Sanctuary when the lightning struck and ignited those fires, the Basin Complex fire in 2008. It was really scary. We only had a little bit of time to get out of there. And we had eight condors in a holding pen and they were really vulnerable to that fire. Thankfully, we got the help of the Coast Guard and after landing at the Condor Sanctuary, Joe and the crew ran about three miles to the holding pen to grab up the eight condors. One of the crew members, Mike Tyner, drove an ATV from the holding pen to the helicopter on the last and most critical trip, escorting out the last two condors and then returning to get the crew members out to safety as well. Just three years later though, Mike Tyner was tragically killed in a storm at the very place where he made that heroic effort. We will always remember Mike and his contributions to condor recovery. But then we had three nesting pairs that were out there vulnerable. Condors don't fly at night, and if the fire burns through when they're vulnerable, it can, it can take some lives. Joe, when, when you found out where the basin fire was burning, you and your team thought you might be doing a dead bird recovery. Tell us about the day that you went to look for Phoenix and, and the story that unfolded there. Yeah, it's a day I'll never forget. Fortunately, I was able to assemble a, a crew of uh, expert climbers to help me out. And we were able to procure a helicopter pilot that was brave enough to take us out there into this really remote spot. And of course, when we arrived on scene, it looked like a bomb went off. It was a major fire had burned, which got our hopes down a little bit, because we were, of course, hoping to find a chick in the tree. And at first look, the tree looked, that whole area looked devastated, but the tree itself actually was burned, and it looked like it had been burned multiple times. And it was still standing, and the top of the tree actually looked somewhat okay. climbers helped get ropes up and we safely got up the tree and I don't climb that much so it was one of the more harrowing climbs I've ever done and as we got closer and closer to the top we started to hear movement and that was super encouraging. As we get up to the actual cavity in the nest about 200 feet off the ground and peek our heads in and a chick was staring back at us and it was alive. <laughs> And it was standing in about three inches of ash inside the cavity. And hence the name, you know, we couldn't help but go, oh my God, the chick not only survived, but it rose from the ashes. So Incredible. the name Phoenix stuck right away. And again, it was one of the, the single biggest miracles I've ever witnessed with condors. But again, it really, spoke to how important redwoods are for condors and this relationship they have with fire. You know, obviously redwoods need fire to survive, yet the redwoods can create through fire, create these cavities the condors can use to nest and also protect them through fire. So fire does conjure up some negative images, but this is a positive story. And as you know, we've, we've really seen a great relationship evolve between and learned about this relationship between condors and redwoods. Yeah, what an incredible survival story that was. 
So Kelly, these birds have incredible stories that are often uniquely entwined. Tell me about their personalities and tell me about Redwood Queen and Kingpin. Condors are so amazing. When we first started studying these birds, we didn't know they had such personalities, that they were just so unique. The way they inter interact with each other and feed together and, and nesting, sometimes even trios form where you have you know, two, two males and, and one female and, and uh, sometimes even the other way around. I mean, these, these birds are just incredibly fascinating and they live a long time. So, you know, people can get to know these birds, especially through the use of our streaming cameras. Kingpin, who unfortunately is no longer with us, mated with Redwood Queen, and they were a long-time pair. And when that pairing took place, Redwood Queen's status in the flock rose greatly because Kingpin is the most dominant bird in the flock. So Joe, in 2006, Kingpin and Redwood Queen made their first nesting attempt, which wasn't viable. What happened there? Well, we climbed into the nest to, to look at the egg, and we found a broken egg, and then we looked at the eggshells, and they were extremely thin. What causes the thinning of the shells? Well, in birds, the biggest culprit is DDT. And this DDT is remnant TDT that's been in the environment for over 60 years, and it persist and the condors ingest the DDT when they eat marine mammals like sea lions and then that gets in their bloodstream and ends up thinning their eggshells. Fortunately we did 10 years of research on the impact of eggshell thinning and found that while there is eggshell thinning it's not at a level that will hurt their production. So redwood queen for example ever since that first egg has laid viable eggs and um, over six chicks in the wild. Do you guys have an exhibit of one of the condor eggs here? Yeah, so we, this isn't a real one. This is one we used and it was really critical in the research phase. This is what we call a dummy egg. It's a replica condor egg. And uh, you can give it a, give it a feel there. It's, um, wow. this was critical in that we could use this egg to swap out from the egg that if we went into the nest and saw the egg was having issues, we could put this egg in as a placeholder until we got an egg from captivity and it really helped increase production in the wild while we were doing this research phase. Fortunately, we don't have to do this uh, part of the management anymore and the pairs are producing it on their own just fine. So it's, uh, it was a critical phase, but again, it's uh, one of the little tricks that we use to really help the birds out and actually help us gain a better understanding of condor reproduction that we never knew about. Absolutely. All right, so this, this egg is like pretty much the size of an avocado. So. You're telling me that North America's largest land bird comes from this egg right here? From that little egg, when a condor chick hatches, it's about the size of your palm of your hand. We actually have some images over here if you want to check out. Yes. So let's go check them out. So yeah, Ross, from this egg to this chick right here. Wow, so it takes six years to reach full adulthood. Yeah, before they can begin nesting in the wild. Amazing. The twists and turns and layers of these birds' life stories often sounds right out of a Hollywood movie. I mean, there's drama, there's danger, conflict, miracles. One condor really comes to mind. Tell me about Aniko. Oh yeah, Aniko is truly a special bird. She was raised by Redwood Queen and Kingpin in 2020. We had a live streaming camera inside of her nest, so the whole world got to watch. And, you know, keep in mind this was during the pandemic. And there was a lot of people that were just cooped up inside and, and watching and, and uh, you know, really getting connected, this young chick and her parents. So, you know, what we did was we, uh, we asked donors to suggest names and we had about 600 name suggestions. And one of those was Aniko, which means born during troubled times. And we just thought that was too perfect. You know, it was the pandemic. Uh, and then later on, the Dolan fire, which made it even more uh, uh, of an ideal name for this young chick. And Joe, August 2020, we had the Dolan fire, right? And so here we are all these years later, what was going through your mind when this fire was ripping through the forest? It was literally a flashback to 12 years before when Phoenix was holed up in that nest and we didn't know if Phoenix had made it and to see a Nico in the same situation. And not only that, to have live streaming cameras 
visually showing not only me, but the world and not knowing what was going to happen. So I was up late that night operating that camera as the fire was bearing down on this nest and also our condor sanctuary. And I was on the edge of my seat with everyone else. My heart was in my throat and it couldn't, you couldn't help but, you know, here we are in the middle of the pandemic and this fire, like what next, you know? And you couldn't help but just feel for Aniko, like just so vulnerable in that nest. Then the, the, the condor cam goes black, and all of a sudden, everyone's wondering the fate of this bird. So tell us about when you finally got to go look for Aniko and what you discovered. Yeah, so that, that night when the cameras got burned out, that no one knew what happened. We were working with Forest Service and finally got clearance because the area was still actively burning for a couple weeks after it burned over in Nico's nest. We finally got clearance and hiked in and it was just similar to when I went out to Phoenix's nest, it looked like a bomb went off, you know, just everything was gone. And uh, the only thing standing was that tree. And I'll never forget, we hiked up and we were coming up over the, the edge of the ridge and I got my first look and I could just look down and look into the cavity and I saw a Nico's head pop out. And we couldn't believe it, you know, another miracle had happened. And uh, again, another redwood had protected its, protected this, this young condor, you know, this crazy relationship condors have with redwoods and fire and, and Nico had survived. Kelly, getting back to these relationship dynamics, I mean, we got to talk about Ninja and what happened there. And then ultimately Kingpin did not survive the fire. So tell us about that. Well, it was a really tough time because as Joe mentioned, we couldn't access the fire area for a number of weeks afterward. And so not only were we worried about Aniko, but we were very concerned about the flock. And after about uh, a week or so, we started noticing a few birds that we normally pick up on radio telemetry, no signals whatsoever. And all of a sudden we started to get this horrible feeling, thinking that we might have lost quite a few birds up there. We know that a lot of condors were roosting that night up in the condor sanctuary when the Dolan fire burned through. So we were just really, really concerned. Only time would, would tell, and unfortunately, or sadly, Kingpin, uh, along with eight other condors, perished that night in the fire. So Kingpin is lost in the Dolan fire, unfortunately, and now another condor, Ninja, comes in. Tell us what happened with, with Ninja and Aniko and Redwood Queen. With the absence of Kingpin, it left this void in the territory. And I think Ninja uh, was trying to move in, you know, to take over this territory. And uh, the problem with that though, is that Aniko was still in the nest. And uh, Ninja decided to try to force Aniko out of the nest. Redwood Queen saw what was happening and went to Aniko's rescue. And the three of them have a scuffle inside the, the, the nest cavity. All three of them came crashing down on the ground. It, it looked really scary. And later on, a biologist went out to go check on Aniko and saw that she had a limp. And so we just didn't know how badly she was injured. And we didn't want to take any chances and uh, let her try to survive in the wild, uh, in particular without uh, you know, Kingpin protecting her in the territory, it, she was more vulnerable. So we decided to capture her and bring her into captivity in hopes that we could re-release her again later. So tell me what happened when you went out to do that rescue operation. Well, anytime you go to help a condor, you, you gotta have all the right equipment, all the right people. So luckily I have a great team and we were able to put a crew of us together and we knew the terrain we were in was very steep and Nico is almost full grown. You know, she's six months old, but she's almost a full-grown condor. So we had to have a kennel ready to go. So again, this is in really remote Big Sur territory and steep terrain. So it was a tedious process. We knew we had to be really careful. We didn't want to cause any additional injury. So luckily we were able to find her and safely corral her. 
And fortunately, Redwood Queen cooperated because, you know, she's a protective mom and she, we didn't know what she would do. And fortunately, she stayed in the trees above and kind of almost knew that I think she knew we were trying to help her chick. And she knew 729 was just a heartbeat away, ready to go in and pounce again. So it was for us, it was uh, it worked out well. We were able to get a Nico corralled in the kennel and the you know, I work with an incredible crew and we were able to hike her all the way out and drive her six hours to LA Zoo. And LA Zoo is one of our great partners, one of the big captive breeding facilities, and they have a state-of-the-art hospital. We knew she'd be in good hands. And whether we like it or not, uh, Zoom became a big part of our lives during the pandemic. And you guys did something really cool. You started these sort of Zoom chats, right? Where you're allowing people to, to log in, tune in, and find out what's going on. What was the reaction like from the global community once they knew that Aniko was safe and headed to the zoo? Yeah, the Zooms were something new for us, but they ended up being, it was kind of a silver lining, and we actually started enjoying them as much as the people <laughs> that were tuning in, because it was such a great bridge of communication and to give the details about what, what happened to Aniko and uh, what was going on with Aniko at every level of her recovery, and then the rest of the flock. It was just this great way for Ventana to get the message out about how the how things were going, how the recovery was going, how Aniko was doing. And, and again, you're straight from the crew, you know, straight from, you know, the front lines, the folks out there working with the birds. And what's this display over here, Joe? Yeah, this showcases how we release the birds. Let's go check it out. So, Kelly, when, it, when a condor is rescued in the wild, they're taken to various facilities for rehabilitation. And in, in the case of Aniko, that was the LA Zoo. So tell us about that rehabilitation process and, and the people that do this work. And thankfully, we have a lot of great partners and we work very closely with the Los Angeles Zoo and the Oakland Zoo. When a, when a condor like Aniko is first taken into captivity for treatment, there's x-rays and lots of uh, intake exams that are done. And in this case, uh, a very thorough exam was done and Aniko did not have any, uh, any major injury, uh, thankfully. So Nico was finally cleared for release at the San Simeon facility. All the world's eyes were on this bird. Tell me about that experience and the emotions around such a, a climactic event. Yeah, I mean, I remember the biggest question we were getting, when is Aniko coming back? When is Aniko? Because we gave people the update that she was going to get better and then it was just a matter of time and we got the final green light from LA Zoo that she was ready for liftoff and which is, it, you know, you, it's kind of surreal at the point, but when it was, the crew and I were excited because when we went to pick her up, it was like we were picking up the celebrity condor <laughs> and she was the, the precious cargo and we drove her all the way up. Got her the San Simeon pen, which there were other release birds in there ready to greet her. After the six weeks hit, we come to the big day, you know, December 2nd, 2021. And it was a momentous day. We had it live streaming. The whole world got to watch her go out with us. And it was this complete full circle story of, you know, and Nico on the verge of death in a fire to getting attacked by this uh, this wild male <laughs> ninja and surviving that and getting cared for by LA Zoo. It was a team effort and to bring her back and then just the support of everyone I think is what Bray helped bring Aniko back to the wild and now she is out flying free once again. So Kelly, this is such a powerful and inspiring story of survival, but the end is yet to be written. Phoenix is now paired with Redwood Queen, and Nico is once again a flight on our coast. I think the future of the flock is, is promising. I think we're showing that it's possible, that we're, we're doing the right things, that these condors are finding food on their own, they're nesting again. It's only a matter of time before we're completely successful. Of course, we have to resolve the lead problem, 
But once we do, the future for the California Condor is very bright. Not only for just Aniko and, and, and Redwood Queen and some of these birds that we've been telling their stories, but every single bird has a unique story to tell. So now that I've been on this journey and gotten to see the, the trials and tribulations of these birds, what's the next step from here? How can I help? Glad you asked. Follow me. All right, Ross, you're in good hands with Kelly here. I got to head out. Go take care of the birds, but it's great seeing you. You too, Jeff. Take it easy. All right, you guys have a good one. So Kelly, you've been doing this work for 25 years. How did you get started working with condors in the first place? Yeah, you know, I've always loved animals and I was born right around the time of the Endangered Species Act being passed and that was really moving for me. Uh, there were a lot of animals in peril. Well, there still are today. That's what, you know, got me started and then I got my first field job reintroducing peregrine falcons in West Virginia, and uh, at that point I was, I was totally hooked. I started a volunteer project with bald eagles while I was still back there, and then that led to a project here in, in California, and we successfully restored bald eagles to Central California and uh, got an invitation to start the Connor program. So it was just, you know, for me, it was being at the right place at the right time and, and following my, my passion in life. And look at this incredible place that you call your office. I mean, this is gorgeous. As I've gotten to have this experience with you guys, you know, I've been wrestling about, you know, how can we be that change that we want to see? And I keep coming back to education is so critical, especially for the next generation of youth coming up. Our vision for the future is for wildlife and humans to coexist and thrive together. So we don't have endangered species, we have healthy populations of animals and people who care about them. That's really at the core of our, our vision. Our vision for the future is for wildlife and people to coexist and thrive, where endangered species no longer need our help. We envision a time when California condors are flying free without wing tags, because those wing tags are really a necessary tool for now, but we would really love to see them without that, without human assistance. And we want to see uh, the future generation inspired about nature and about wildlife, to care about wildlife so that we can continue the work that we're doing well beyond our time here on Earth. And Ventana Wildlife Society is really a very layered, robust organization. Of course, you've got biologists with boots on the ground at the sanctuary. You've got people all the way down at the release facility in San Simeon, all over the place doing a lot of work. And then, of course, you've got the headquarters. So tell me about some of the outreach programs that you're doing. You've got the Zoom chats. You've really, in a very powerful way, been able to uh, bring voices from all over the world into the fold with this condor restoration program. People are really getting invested in the lives of these birds, and it's actually generating a lot more interest. Yeah, it's a critical piece to our outreach strategy. And you know, before Zoom chats, for example, uh, it was very hard to reach people around the world. And now every, every last Thursday of the month, we have a couple hundred people from all over, from multiple different countries and, and joining us and learning about what's going on, hearing directly from the field biologists, what's happening with the condors. And it's, it's really a great way to stay involved. And that's, you know, you had asked about how to stay involved and that's really a great way Another way is to uh, follow through the streaming cameras and help us keep track of these birds. Uh, we've actually had cam viewers alert us to condors that were injured and helped us recover those birds and, and treat them and release them back to the wild. Of course, private donations is really important to keep the programs going, whether it's youth education or, or uh, California condor recovery work and just getting the message out there. I really appreciate how much time you spent. I mean, you really dug deep into this. You've spent numerous days really learning what's going on. And, and you are in a unique position to help us get that word out. Well, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, it's, 
It's really been an eye-opening and frankly, a life-changing experience for me. So I thank you guys for you know, bringing me into your world. I've learned so much, I've seen so much, and I'm, I'm really proud to go out into the world and be an ambassador for the work you're doing. Awesome, thanks again for coming. I know you gotta get going, but before you go, I got a little token appreciation for you. Oh, love it. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, just give me a sec. Yep. Just a little keepsake for your time spent with us, Ross. Oh, wow. Thanks so much. I'm a big fan of the work you guys do, so let's definitely keep in touch. I look forward to it. Right on, Kelly. Thanks again. All right. As I parted ways with Kelly and the Ventana Wildlife Society team, I reflected back on the powerful, eye-opening journey I had been on into the lives of the condors, their unique and curious stories, their ecological importance, their plight, and all of the wonderful people working hard to ensure their survival as a species. What an honor to witness such important wildlife conservation up close. To be in the presence of a bird so rare, many do not know they exist. But with this newfound knowledge comes a responsibility to take what I've learned and share it inspire the next generation, and help open eyes to a cause that is as noble as it is critical. We all have stories, and so do the condors. Join me in sharing them, and together we can make a difference.